uh, we are uh, uh, discussing some aspects of uh, uh, scattering and transport in uh, uh, semiconductors, and it's kind of a natural prelude to uh, interaction of, li uh, of electrons with, uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, photons, which is light. In fact, we have kind of already started talking about it indirectly uh, as we uh, uh, develop the formalism for Boltzmann transport. And today, uh, so this is kind of the assignment problem you are looking at right now. Uh, uh, you're going to look at uh, how uh, concepts of uh, scattering limited transport, like mobility or uh, uh, you know, s s a scattering t effective scattering time, uh, come out of Boltzmann transport equation. First, second is we're going to look at. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, the main goal of this exercise is 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 to to be able to uh, uh, from the uh, conceptually from the Boltzmann transport equation, which we kind of wrote down in the last class, uh, 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 <coughs> how do we get useful numbers for uh, understanding and you know the, and uh, designing um, uh, semiconductor systems, and in particular, uh, uh, what parameters are measurable? I think in the lab also you measured some things like mobilities and all that. So we're now trying to relate that to a microscopic picture. And so that comes about by first finding out what is my uh, distribution function uh, or the occupation function uh, of uh, electrons in the k space, right? Because once I know the occupation function f of k, I can find pretty much all transport, I can answer all transport problems. Uh, I, for looking at the charge current, I just have to sum over group velocities of electrons. And if you want to find other things like heat current, thermoelectric current, all of them are basically a small change instead of electron velocity, you might have electron kinetic energy or something like that. And you will get the net uh, current uh, uh, using this formalism. It's a very powerful way of thinking about uh, transport in general. So uh, Boltzmann transport equation is giving us, uh, uh, is, is what, uh, how we get the distribution function under non-equilibrium situations. So, uh, so I, I'll come back to this again, but uh, kind of this is, gives you the whole picture of the scattering limited mobility or scattering lim limited transport. Uh, you first identify a little defect that is going to cause scattering. Uh, it could be an ionized impurity, uh, an ionized donor, uh, and then find out the potential, and then use that to find out the scattering rate tau that goes into that Boltzmann uh, uh, solution. And then from that tau, uh, uh, we can uh, find out the net mobility and write the current as, as a function of that. So essentially, that's the picture. Uh, we, we, uh, and, and today I'm going to show you this whole uh, you know, uh, loop uh, 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 starting from the Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, okay, and, and uh, uh, just kind of uh, as a bookkeeping, uh, quite a few of these things are in slide handout number 22 of, your, uh, 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 of the things posted on, online. And also uh, they are in this chapter 15, at least the formalism of transport is written out in chapter 15. Okay? So you can kind of do a little bit of both. Uh, uh, the handout has uh, 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 um, more examples than the short chapter, yes, just to be clear. Yeah. OK, so uh, I'll, I'll kind of, uh, uh, so, so uh, we'll uh, come back to this. Let's uh, look at the uh, uh, picture again. So, so uh, what we have been. Uh, able to do in the last class is uh, 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 write down from from uh, looking at so the Boltzmann transport equation by looking at uh, transport of carriers in what we call as the phase space, uh, right? Uh, we we uh, said let's say this is uh, real space and that's k uh, or momentum, and we looked at uh, uh, paths or tra and trajectories that uh, 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 a particle beta classical or quantum particle. For quantum particles, we, we said that uh, instead of real, you know, uh, so we have a little wave function, if you might, in real space. Or in other words, uh, you have a certain fuzziness to the uh, location of the particle of the electron and a certain fuzziness to the uh, uh, momentum of the particle, such that these two obey the uncertainty principle, right, for a quantum particle. And uh, based on this, essentially, uh, uh, we, we, we wrote down that the rate of change of 
occupation function in, as a function of k uh, 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 was, was given by uh, changes because of, uh, uh, you know, basically whatever probability was here at t minus dt must be the probability here at t plus dt if the whole thing is flowing under the influence of electric fields or, you know, other, other distribution, you know, uh, if the electron is moving with a certain velocity, then uh, uh, so you'd get, uh, I'll, I'll write down the one dimensional version, so uh, del f by del x, if it's moving, if, if the uh, occupation, if the particle is moving in the x direction, uh, the x is changing, if there's a force, the k is changing, right? K, right? So those are the changes, uh, and and uh, we said that the either the probability just came from here, because you know because of the forces, uh, the the particle was here at time t minus dt, and now it's here at sorry at time t. Either the probability came from here, or it came because of scattering in, or it, you lost some probability because of scattering out. I mean that was the formalism. Uh, there's a scattering in and a scattering out. The out scattering rate uh, uh, is uh, uh, given by uh, you know the rate at which you can go out times if these are electrons, this state must be occupied and k prime states must be empty. And using that, so we wrote s k prime to k. This is the you know in scattering term. And to for this to happen, f of k prime must be occupied, and one minus f of k should be, uh, you know, or k should be empty. What is the value of f of k or k prime? W meaning what's the range it can, you know, take values over? Zero to one. I mean, this is the occupation probability of that k state. You know, so, so that's, that's uh, uh, you know, just to be clear. Minus uh, uh, the out uh, scattering is, you go from k to k prime. So k is kind of the central point we're looking at, uh, you know, this is, uh, this value is k. All others are k primes, you know, so, so all other points are k primes. So again, here it should be 1 minus f of k prime. And uh, uh, so, so if we are looking at, uh, uh, if we are tracking the occupation function of just this state k, then uh, the scattering in and scattering out could be because of all other possible states, right? All other states, not just, you know, 1 k prime, but all of them. So we sum over all, all, all other states, and that's your full Boltzmann transport equation. So just, uh, this is where we ended in the last class, and then this is one dimensional. If you want to make it three dimensional, this just becomes a vector, and you get a gradient over real space, right? I'm not doing that, but you can generalize it in all dimensions. So you can see this is kind of a, a, a uh, you know, you have uh, real space, momentum space, and time. And, and uh, uh, if you are in three dimensions in real space, you also are in three dimensions in k space. And then time is another dimension, so it's kind of a seven dimension. So that's where generally it would live if you know, the function is a, it's a function in seven dimensions, if you might. But, but the physical meaning is very clear, right, what it is. Right? And, uh, and, and, and uh, whatever be its values in seven dimensions, it always is a value between zero and one. So, so that's the other thing. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so now uh, kind of making some headway into it, uh, let's try to uh, uh, look at uh, what, uh, and, and first, of, and the other thing I just want to make, make sure we understand is there is really, uh, this is just what you call as, you know, uh, uh, bookkeeping, if you, if you might. I mean, we are just accounting for it. There's no physics inside here. I mean, no new physics here. You know? You're just counting states. That's all there is. You know? so, so, and, and saying that. It must be conserved. Mm, you know, that, that, that's the only message in the Boltzmann transport equation. Yeah. So now we are going to invoke some physics. Yeah. Uh, if the probability of it being an FK is 1, I realize it's not really physical, but if, it, if that probability is 1, and then we have a scatter in term, how do we rectify that? Because that, doesn't that give us a probability greater than 1 of finding it in that state if it's already 1, and then we have a scatter in term 2? Right. So that will take care of that. It will, you cannot, cannot, oh, you okay. cannot scatter in. Good question. So if FK is 1, then you can't scatter in. So this is where Pauli blocking, you know, an exclusion principle is taken into account, right? Okay. And similarly, if, you know, so, so this takes that into account. Uh, and, 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 and so the solution, you'll, whatever you get, it will be a function f of k. And you know, very, one can make a picture of it. 
as a function of k, uh, you know, f of k, and, and the max value it can really take is 1, right? And it will have some distribution in, 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 in k space. If I'm looking at one dimension, uh, then, then it will have some distribution here, right? Now, uh, maybe before we, uh, so the right-hand side here, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a somewhat uh, what's called an integral differential function, but we can write, this is a notation we can use. This is called a collision integral, just a fancy name. So it's just saying it's some operator acting on f of k, and that operator is some sort of a strange operator. You can see it's going to first takes one minus that function, then does this sum over all k primes by multiplying it with f of k prime, and then, it multiplies with, with this thing and this thing, and then sums over. So it's kind of an op some, some sort of a complicated function of f of k. Does that make sense? On the right. So it's called a collision integral. And, uh, and the reason for that is uh, inside it uh, hides all the uh, detailed uh, microscopic details of scattering and you know, uh, interaction of the electron with the lattice, with defects. Everything is buried inside the right, on the right-hand side. Uh, so all internal forces that may be acting on the electron uh, uh, because of defects and scattering and phonons are all buried inside the right-hand side here, within the collision integral. None of it appears on the left side. None of it. Left side, what are things uh, that are in here? So if your occupation function is changing in real space, what does that physically mean? It means that in real space, uh, I have more electrons here then I have electrons here, right? That's physically what it means. So, so if I were to plot my electron density n of x, which is basically a sum over all f of k, does that make sense at x, right? Then my electron density is changing right? in, in, in x. And, and uh, I think you, you know what, what that would lead to. It will obviously, if my electron density is higher here and lower here, there'll be a driving force for it to balance out. And that is called the diffusion term. So this is the diffusion, diffusion we have looked at at the very beginning of the course. So, uh, and so this is the diffusion term of Boltzmann transport equation that's driving electrons to go from, you know, to have a equal density everywhere, uniform density everywhere. And the strength with which that happens depends on how fast the electrons can move. And that's, you know, the coefficient of the, you know, in some, it's not a diffusion coefficient, but something like that, right? Uh, now, this is the drift term. Drift term is if I have an external electric field or a force or external magnetic field, how, how does f of k change? So this is a diffusion term, and this is a drift term, and this is the rate at which you know, the whole function is changing, and you know, so, so, yeah. So, uh, so those, are, those are all the details. Let's look at first uh, the simplest situation when uh, there is no diffusion, so that is zero, and there is no drift. So that's zero, right? So we are going to first look at, uh, okay, the first case is the simplest, and that's equilibrium. And uh, I'll try to kind of make sure that we are very clear uh, with, uh, of what equilibrium is, and because the second thing we'll look at is, is steady state. You know, and steady state uh, is, is, is uh, not equilibrium, and I'll try to make the distinction very clear. So at equilibrium, uh, there are no external forces acting on it. There's no external forces, and there's no diffusion, you know, there's no, there are no gradients here, if, if you, you know, think of it this way. So let's assume that it's completely uniform. Electron density is not changing with, with, with uh, x. Uh, so those two terms go away. And so what we have then is uh, uh, two terms left. This rate of change of the distribution function is equal to this collision integral on the right side. So now the question we uh, want to ask is, is uh, at equilibrium, uh, what is the meaning of equilibrium? The meaning of equilibrium is really that this is not changing with time. Right? F of k, uh, let's, instead of k, let's say, uh, if I choose a certain k, I can find the f of k for that. Let's say this is my energy versus k. And I'm, I'm looking at this k state and say that occupation function of it is f of k. Right? This is the probability with which this state is occupied. And then now I'm looking at it, how does it evolve with time if I'm sitting at equilibrium? Right? And what's the answer? How does it evolve with time? The definition of equilibrium is there's no ch change, right? It's, it's the same. f of k doesn't change, right? Does that make sense? That's the definition of equilibrium. So let's say it's not 1, it was 0.5 or something like that or something like that. So what we are saying is it's not changing with time. Right? 
And uh, again, I'm saying this at a certain level because if you go down microscopically at very, very short time scales, there are things happening, right? There are things happening that, but this, but, but this is kind of a, uh, um, okay, uh, let me, let, let's look at that then. So what we're saying is this is zero, right? That's the meaning of equilibrium. But then we look at the right side, uh, you see that, uh, uh, that that tells me that the, uh, this whole sum over k primes of s of the in scattering terms k prime to k f of k prime minus s of k to k prime right times f of k prime oh, sorry f of k k prime and this whole thing should be equal to zero right but the question is uh, uh, are scattering events going on at equilibrium or not right so so are there is s in you know is this is this term uh, zero uh, also or is it not zero that's the question so physically or intuitively what would you think no, it's, zero. it's not zero scattering can always happen right i mean electrons can always uh, move in because if the lattice is sitting at equilibrium at a high temperature the lattice the atoms are vibrating you know and all that and the electron can get kicked around uh, electron at k prime can easily get scattered into this state. Electron from this state can also get out here. So this is a zero in the sense that the total sum is zero, right? But the individual terms not, are not necessarily zero, right? So th that's the meaning of, of, of uh, uh, equilibrium. And it's in, in a way, you can see it's similar to current being zero, but there's a right going and a left going part, kind of like that. But it's not exactly that. It's slightly different, you know? So, so so that's one thing, uh, but then uh, what is interesting is you can write this equation for any k state. You can write it for k or k prime or k double prime, whatever, any k state, right? You can write this equation for any k state, in which case this equation actually, there are all these terms for different k primes. Each of them individually have to be equal to zero. So this is kind of an important point, right? This is called microscopic irreversibility. This is introduced by Boltzmann himself. <coughs> what he said that, uh, yes, the sum is zero, but then because this equation remains valid for all k's, meaning if I have another k prime, so the, the occupation probability of that is also not changing with time. So this is not changing with time. So whatever I might lose here must be gained by here in, in some sense. So it, on, the, on the whole, there can't be any change to any of these f of k's. Right. Does that make sense? So in other words, this is actually not necessary for, micro, for at equilibrium. You know? Each of them is actually at zero as well. Right? This microscopic irreversibility, yeah. So that means, so uh, for each scattering of a certain k to prime to k, there's the same scatter out for k to k prime? Basically, or this whole term is equal to zero. Yeah. And we'll now see that this will lead to a couple of very remarkable results right away. So meaning, in this, this hopefully was clear that why this should be, because that's the meaning of equilibrium. But then, now, uh, uh, because this equation is valid for all k's, you know, k, k prime and all that, each of these terms must be individually equal to zero. And so instead of summing it, you know, I can say that you know, for all k and k prime, this must be true. Okay. That's it. So we are summing, instead of summing one and minus one, I'm summing zero plus zero you know, to get the zero. That's the physical. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not following the logic here, because you could imagine some conspired situation where this state jumps to the next one, and that one jumps to the next one, and everyone's just doing a big circle. Yeah, yeah. It's not always true that for every k state, the scattering from one to two is equal to the scattering from two to one. No, that is not true. That is correct. And we'll see now. But then the scattering, the net scatter, uh, occupation probability of each of these k states, the scattering from state, uh, the net scattering rate, if you might, from k to k prime, is not necessarily equal to of the reverse process. And we'll see that right now. But when you sum over the total number of particles, it, this is actually a consequence of what's called the Liouville theorem. It's a, it's, a, it's a conservation law, meaning the net probability of, the net number of particles is the same. You know? and, and it's divided into different k's. And at equilibrium, uh, you know, the, 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 so at equilibrium, the f of k's cannot change. You know? so, so that's physically why it's conserved. You know? Each of these, so we can maybe discuss this a little bit more later, if you might. But uh, and not only that, this uh, so each of them is equal to z is is uh, equal to zero individually, and what is f of k? 
at equilibrium. We actually know the thing. What, what is f of k at equilibrium for electrons, for example? This is the meaning of what we call as, uh, this is the Fermi Dirac distribution. That's the meaning. This is the equilibrium occupation function. We know that exactly. You know, so, so f of k, I write 0 here to indicate equilibrium. And so uh, this will be e to the power you know, energy of k state minus the Fermi level, which is unique at equilibrium over Boltzmann constant times temperature. So in other words, whenever I, when I remove this sum and I invoke equilibrium, I must have zeros here, which indicate that this is not just any distribution function. It is the Fermi Dirac distribution function. It's unique. You know? And, and uh, so, so, OK, so is that clear? I mean, so essentially, whenever I have electrons, no matter what situation I put them in, you know, put in them helium or a semiconductor in a metal, and they're at equilibrium with whatever surrounding they're at, and the surrounding, all the information of the surrounding comes in into the e electron distribution through this term, the temperature. Okay. Temperature is how the electron is seeing the surroundings, right? And that, but then at equilibrium, the distribution function is locked to Fermi Dirac distribution. That's the meaning of the you know, Fermi Dirac distribution, it's a statistical concept. And uh, uh, this is the uh, solution to the Boltzmann transport equation. In other words, at equilibrium, the Boltzmann transport equation is exactly solved. You have your f of k. Does that make sense? I mean, we, we didn't really have to do much work. We have done the work earlier, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, you know, electrons and exclusion principle and you know, where this thing comes from. But this is exactly solved. Uh, and then now you can see that if that's f of k, uh, the other thing you need here is like 1 minus f of k. So what is 1 minus f of k at equilibrium? That's just e to the power e k minus the Fermi level over k b t. Right? And you can take the ratio. Uh, why do I want to take the ratio? Let's see. You, you see this equation. Uh, and I, I take this here, and I write that s of k prime to k divided by s of k to k prime. Right. So I uh, write this divide by that, and I'll get f of k is 0 uh, over 1 minus f of k is 0 and 1 minus f of k prime is 0. So we're comfortable with that. I'll just kind of rearrange this uh, uh, equilibrium uh, equation. And this is, by the way, it's not approximate. This is an exact relation. And, 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 and now uh, you can see that if I take the ratio, this divided by that, right? All I'm, I mean, the denominators cancel out, right? This and this cancel out when I take the ratio. Uh, what, all I'm left with is the numerator here, right? You can see that? And so that, that becomes, oh, let's write that here. That becomes e to the power ek minus ef over kt over e to the power e k prime minus e f over k t. Right? The one plus things in the Fermi Dirac distribution, they cancel out. And also the Fermi level cancels out because that's unique too. Okay? So that cancels out, so I, I get a much simpler expression now that, uh, I think, uh, did I do it right? E of k. S of k prime to k is f of k, right. OK, so actually, f of k, oh, so I, I think I wrote it upside down. This divided by this should have minus of that, right? So, so yeah, you can see that this will become e k prime minus e of k. That's what it's going to become. The difference of the two energies, k prime will be, you know, uh, k prime to k divided by scattering of k to k prime is equal to this relation. And let's just sketch this now. So, so. so let's say this is state k prime, and this is state k. And uh, physically, there could be two states here. This is k, and that could be k prime. Does that make sense? 
this in the band structure picture, this is k prime as an example. And this, it, the ordering could be different. K prime, k prime may be below k. It doesn't matter. You can choose whatever you want. And, and this energy uh, given by the band structure for k is e, e of k, and this is e of k prime, and could be, you know, they could be also the same. They could be the same energy too. I mean, same energy too, because yes, you can have k here and k prime on the other side. They can have the same energy too. That's possible. But regardless, uh, what we are seeing here now is is uh, physically something about the microscopic scattering rate. You know, this is a rate. Remember df by dt, so this is rate, you know, change. And uh, this is dimensionless, so this has units of one over time. And this is a rate of scattering, uh, typically in kind of inverse spec picoseconds. That's roughly the scale at which scattering occurs in, in semiconductors. Uh, but then it's saying that, uh, uh, you know, there's a preference for uh, scattering uh, to go downwards in energy. This is what it's saying here. You see, if E of k prime is larger than E of k, right? If E of k prime is larger than E of k, then this thing here is positive, right? Uh, so e to the power something which is, uh, you know, larger than zero is greater than one, right? And so scattering k prime to k, which is downwards, is more probable, or uh, the rate is higher than scattering upwards. That's the physical meaning here, right away, right? So, so this is uh, S of k prime to k, and that is S of k to k prime. And I'm going to now make a couple of uh, things here. So, so uh, is that clear? I mean, so it's saying that, uh, and it really does not matter what process this scattering is coming from. It's defects, phonons, light, whatever be it, it doesn't matter. It's just, it, it, this, is, this is basically, uh, what you call is an accounting principle. It cannot be wrong because uh, if, if this goes wrong, then things will, you know, it will not satisfy equilibrium. It's kind of a very important point here. Yeah. So, uh, so scattering uh, uh, downwards has, is, more, is, 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 is more is favored. Uh, and and uh, you can see, I mean, this is actually, this is what brings the system to equilibrium. <coughs> it, it actually tries to uh, go to lower energies. Now, let's say that this difference between the two energies is h bar times omega. Okay. Let's say. I mean, this is just a notation, but very soon this will become the phonon energy or a photon energy and things like that. You know, so. And h bar omega could equally be zero. You know, they could be the same energy too. That's fine. You know, so so uh, now if uh, this, h, this is h bar omega, uh, you can see that uh, uh, going up in energy is what you can call as a process by which this electron here has to absorb h bar omega of energy from somewhere else. Not from electrons, but from somewhere else. Right? It has to absorb h bar omega to get here. Right? So that's, that's what we'll call as the absorption, uh, the, the rate of absorption, right? S absorption. And similarly, going down, we're going to call as rate of emission. Because the electron, if it's that, at that state, has to dump this much of energy into wherever. It's not ele other electrons. It's going to, you know, because this electron transitions here, the, the, this energy has to go somewhere. And this can go into two, two uh, 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 processes. Uh, one is we are, we're going to see uh, what, what we will look at is this kind of a, both are modeled as harmonic oscillators with the energy of h bar omega. One is, will be phonons which is lattice vibrations, and the other would be photons, which is obviously light. And that's where the, light is, uh, the, the energy is going to go. Right? So for light, uh, your, your, your typical transition will be from E of k, he, k prime here to E of k somewhere here, another band. For phonons, it can be within the same band. Just, just kind of pointing out a couple of things that's to come. But regardless, uh, this system Phonons or photons will be what we call as a bosonic system. It's a boson system, Bose-Einstein distribution system. It's not a fermionic system. It's going to be a Bose system right? for our case here. Phonons are bosons as well as photons. Both are bo bosonic particles. They satisfy, uh, instead of Fermi-Dirac distribution, they satisfy the Bose-Einstein distribution function. There's the only small difference. There's a, this minus one in the denominator. Right? So, 
So uh, let me just uh, point that out. So, so if I have a phonon energy of h bar omega, then the number of phonons, just like Bose-Einstein distribution, you also have the Bose, uh, sorry, just like the fermi Dirac distribution, the number of phonons uh, will be kVt minus one. That's the Bose-Einstein distribution. And when I write it phonons, I, I, I use this symbol because it's equally true for photons too. Light as well. So it'll be minus one. And you know, just because uh, I, I won't kind of uh, show this, uh, and uh, uh, let's do a uh, plus one of this. If I take this number and I take add one to it, uh, you can see that you know I get a uh, denominator and all that. So so I will get e to the power h bar omega over kBT over kBT minus one. So so you know, just I just wrote it down because it's going to appear now. Uh, so why did I write it this way? Uh, here, here's a uh, very, uh, what do you call it, as a heuristic argument. So for an electron to scatter and go upwards from Ek to Ek prime, it must absorb a phonon or a photon, I mean, whatever be it, right? It must absorb h bar omega of energy. But it can only absorb the number of particles that are already there, right? I mean, so, so the electron can absorb, or in other words, let me just write that down, absorption rate is proportional to the number of phonons. Does it make sense? If, if there are no phonons, there's nothing to absorb, right? So it must be proportional to the number of phonons. If you are sitting at a very, very low temperature, this process is not going to happen because there are no phonons to make this happen. It must absorb or uh, take away some energy from the uh, from from you know this this uh, bosonic bath, if you might, of, of phonons or photons. Uh, is that clear? And then we are saying that now that is S of k to k prime or upward scattering rate is, is proportional to that, right? And now our microscopic reversibility, or, or rather Boltzmann equation is telling me the following, that look, uh, in, in, if, if that is so, then the other process, k prime to k, you know, is, is S emission, right, is equal to, remember from here, you will get E k prime minus E of k is just h bar omega, right? Right. So you must get, this is equal to E of h bar omega over kBT times S absorption. Does that make sense? From here, right away. The, upward, uh, the downward going process is h, E to the power h bar omega times the upward going process rate. Right? Is that clear what I wrote? You can briefly stop here for a moment because this is uh, uh, yeah, so, so from here, you can see E of k prime minus E of k is h bar omega. So it must be like that. Now, uh, and now if, if this, so, so you can see that uh, th that's exactly equal, but now I can say that the emission pr rate then must be proportional. I replace this by n phonons, okay? And I write as e to the power h bar omega by kBT times the n of phonons because that's just proportional to the number of phonons. Absorption rate is proportional to the number of phonons. So now, from here and from here, you realize that uh, if I take n phonons plus 1, what I get is e to the power h bar omega by k by t times n phonons. It's kind of an interesting property of the Bose-Einstein distribution. You can see that, right? Because you know this thing and this thing, and that's just the whole science right. So in other words, what it's saying is the emission rate is proportional not to the number of phonons that are already there, right? but it is proportional to 1 plus the number of phonons that are already there. There's an extra factor of 1. That's what it means. Right? Just from you know very simple analysis here, uh, and 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 then saying the only physical assumption we have made is the absorption rate must be proportional to the number of phonons or photons available, and then immediately tells you then the emission rate is proportional to one plus the number of phonons or photons that are available, right? and and that that is a actually rather profound result in some sense because you can see that if if there are no phonons or photons at all, the electron is perfectly capable of emitting a phonon. 
It's no problem. And that's because there's a one here, right? right? It's perfectly capable. It doesn't need any extra phonons or photons to emit an, another one. Right? It is already, it's, uh, and so that's why this emission process is called spontaneous emission. It doesn't need any sort of help. It's going to spontaneously emit. You know? <coughs> right? so, so it can, it can emit whether or not there are any phonons or photons available. And the second pa part here, if there are some photons or phonons available, then it's going to re increase the rate at which it's going to emit. Right? It's going to stimulate the process. Does that make sense? It's going to stimulate it or make it faster. So that's why the second term is called sp stimulated emission. Right? And this is kind of one of the very interesting results that falls out of the equilibrium distribution function of uh, uh, electrons. And this will happen any time we couple a uh, fermionic system with a bosonic system in general. I mean, but. Uh, because this is a property of any bosonic system, which follows the Bose-Einstein distribution. Uh, and if you're dumping energy or taking energy out of a bosonic system, the emission rate will always be composed of two things. One is spontaneous emission, the other is stimulated emission. And uh, spontaneous emission, you cannot change it. It's, it's one. Stimulated emission, you can change it, meaning if you have more uh, phonons or more photons, it's going to only accelerate this faster and faster. So, so there's a sort of feedback here. And that's clearly, I mean, that is the heart of a laser, for example, right? you know, stimulated emission. When, when, when the electron, we kind of dominate, I mean, this term starts dominating and it, it becomes light. You amplify light or light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And the radiation there is not, you know, th these things are ph photons instead of phonons. So, yeah. yeah, there was a question. Um, I think you actually just answered it, uh, okay. sort of, but just to maybe get an elaborated answer. So you said that um, the fermionic and bosonic uh, systems have to be coupled. So having more phonons and photons in a system, I guess I was wondering uh, if you have your hypothetical electron and they are communicating, you know, with these phonons or photons, then this wouldn't occur. The stimulated emission, but the word sort of. How do they communicate with that electron? Do they actually have to scatter off it in order for it to yeah, yeah. see that term? Like yeah, indeed. I, yeah, that? we have, uh, that's a good point. So this, all this is true only if the electron is interacting uh, with the phonons or the photons. If it is not, then you know we are not those phonons and photons. We are not talking about them here. Okay. The phonons and photons we are talking about here are only the ones that are interacting with the electron system. So yeah, is so there a sort of saturation term that would go into there when you wrote it out absolutely rather than proportionally in which there's some total number of these phonons and photons per second that can interact? With right. Yeah, we will see that, uh, you know, this proportionality term uh, has what you call as the matrix element that determines whether this pr process is even possible or not, you know. Okay. And, and that's the Fermi golden rule. We'll see that now. Right. So that, that, that this, this is essentially kind of doing the accounting, not kind of being completely agnostic to whether that process is possible or not. But if it is possible, this is the situation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess I'm not fully for having fully for this up, but we used the Fermi Dirac distribution function to derive this relationship, which is we assumed that we had an equilibrium Fermi Dirac distribution. Yes. But in a laser you don't have the equilibrium yes. distribution. So <coughs> I mean Clearly, you said this is the heart of the laser, but is that still going to apply? Absolutely, it will. It will. Yeah, indeed. So uh, let's see. So the question you're asking is: is uh, so we'll see that. Uh, 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 I don't want to confuse you more, but you know, I, well, non-equilibrium is always a misnomer, right? Because if you consider the whole system, everything is always under equilibrium, the entire system, right? But uh, if we, in the laser, if we look at just the electron distribution, it is way out of equilibrium. Really, uh, that's true. But in a laser, uh, we'll see that what we are going to define it as uh, an equilibrium distribution function for the electrons in the conduction band and a separate one for the holes in the valence band. Among themselves in the conduction band, the electrons are in equilibrium. Among themselves in the valence band, the holes are in equilibrium, but they have different Fermi levels. And that's the measure of how far out of equilibrium they are. That's, uh, let's just say that that's an approximation, but an incredibly great approximation works. I mean, it explains everything quantitatively. So uh, 
to solve things exactly, uh, you must consider then, you know, basically you get a couple Boltzmann equation for a laser tube. And then you must also consider phonons. We have not even included phonons in this. You must include the phonon distribution also. There are two couple systems. There's the electron distribution. And then if you're talking about phonons or photons, you know, so photons may be uh, linear dispersion. It's a couple system now. So you must include all of them. But what I'm trying to get to is uh, no matter which way you discuss, this will always turn up. No matter which way you go, whether you're in equilibrium or you're slightly out of equilibrium, this will always turn up. And this process is a fundamental process, and it will occur there too. Just that you know, some details may just vary a little bit. OK, so, uh, so spontaneous emission and stimulated emission can be uh, kind of, you know, at least uh, uh, they make an appearance right away uh, by looking at the equilibrium uh, situation. Uh, and <coughs> Yeah, so when we say, uh, let me just say that uh, maybe a little more technical answer to your question is how can we invoke equilibrium uh, if we are actually out of equilibrium here? And the way we're invoking is, we, this, it's implicit in this assumption that uh, if I say that the rate at which electrons can absorb phonons or photons is proportional to this, that means they are already talking and there's a certain degree of equilibrium there to be able to say that. <coughs> Okay, so uh, so that's 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 for uh, equilibrium. Uh, the main point is uh, uh, at equilibrium, the Fermi uh, the, the the distribution function is Fermi Dirac distribution. So let and it's not changing with time. Let's say f k of zero. This is kind of the main point. And then you can see that if it's interacting with, a, with any sort of a uh, lattice vibration system, which is phonons or light, it will do this sort of business. It will have a propensity to. Uh, uh, Whenever there's an absorption process, it'll be proportional to the number of, you know, uh, particles that can give it energy. But the emission process is one plus that, and that's part of it is spontaneous. The other is stimulated. Okay. And and uh, you can kind of apply this to many many situations: uh, electrons interacting with phonons, polarons, spin waves. I mean, it's the same deal. You know, every time it's the same deal. You will whenever there's a bosonic system, you'll end up with one plus this. So it's kind of emphasizing again. Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is, is uh, when we pull the system out of equilibrium now. And, and that's uh, 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 the, the concept. Conceptually, what we want to discuss now is, so by the way, this is written up in the notes. So, uh, can you <coughs> And just to you know, have an estimate, uh, you can see that if uh, phonon energy is about, you know, t uh, let's say 50 MeV or so, then uh, e to the power h bar omega by kT, let's say it's 80 MeV for argument's sake. Then this thing is three, uh, it, it, this is 26 MeV at room temperature. And if, let's say this is three times 26 MeV, that would be kind of a wide band gap semiconductor. Then it's like either about three, so that's 20. So that's the number we're looking at, you know, uh, e to the power. Uh, so n phonon, one over, uh, you know, at, at that. So anyway, so, so you can see that we are looking not at very large, or very small, it's kind of very reasonable numbers, you know, integer, uh, close to 10 sort of numbers. It's not, not, not huge, just small. You know. uh, okay, so uh, the second thing, now is uh, um, non-equilibrium, but then we are going to look at a specific case of non-equilibrium, which is the steady state. All right. At steady state, and the specific example I'm interested in is when I apply an electric field. So the diffusion part, let's neglect it for now. We'll come back to it. So this term is still zero, but this term is not zero now. I have an external electric force acting on the electron system now. So that's, that's the, and so now my equation becomes, okay, uh, plus uh, the force, and the force, uh, uh, right, let's write it. No, oh, sorry, what am I doing? D of F of K over partials is equal to, uh, is equal to your kind of uh, uh, collision integral on the right side. 
By the way, I, I forgot to mention one more important thing. Uh, so we got that uh, S of K prime to K divided by S of K to K prime. The inverse process was e to the power k prime minus k over kt, right? So that immediately also tells you that if the process of scattering is elastic, if it doesn't change the energy of the partic particle, then the two rates are equal, right? If it's an elastic scattering process, then, you know, uh, right, so that, that's obvious, but that's actually important now, so I want to kind of write that down. Elastic means E of K, or in other words, the electron is not changing its kinetic energy because of scattering. E of K prime is equal to K, and therefore S of K is equal to K prime. And K to K prime, the reverse process. I mean, both processes have equal rates. K prime to K or K to K prime. So, uh, yeah. So, in both situations, I don't know if you're about to say, like, say, say all the diffusion to zero, but in, in the first case, we yeah. set the drift of diffusion terms to zero. Right. And we also did steady state because we did DDT. Right, so I will try to distinguish between the steady state and equilibrium now. But uh, So I'm saying that equilibrium is when d by dt is equal to zero. Steady state is when d by dt is not equal to zero. But it is, uh, uh, le let's, let's look at it now. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to clarify that part now. Okay. F of k prime. One minus uh, okay, so so that whole thing now again on the right side. So I'm taking away the diffusion term now, and but retaining the drift term uh, or the force activated change in k. So so now um, So on the, on, on the right side, there's obviously a lot of this. Essentially, one has to solve this to find the f of k if I have an electric force now. I'm going to say, you know, rewrite the force as, uh, I think there's kind of a <laughs> little bit of a, okay, so q times electric field, uh, but the q is negative, so kind of, you know, electron charge is negative, q times electric field E, and that's, that's your net force on, on, on the electron. And it can, you know, if you're in higher, dimensions, you just have to make sure that it's a vector and you take a dot product and that sort of thing. But uh, that's, that, that would be the steady state situation. And uh, you can see on the right side, uh, there's obviously a, a bit of complications there. And you can uh, uh, use this relation to kind of try to simplify the, uh, uh, simplify the right hand side. Right? But I'm going to make an approximation at this point. Um, you don't have to, but this is, uh, I'm going to make an approximation that we are looking at purely elastic processes. I'm going to just make that approximation. If you don't, then that equation will kind of not be exactly solvable. But if you do, then, w uh, uh, okay, so, so we're going to make an approximation now that it's an elastic scattering process, in which case this and this are equal, right? If it's an elastic scattering process, so we are making that approximation now. or EK is equal to EK prime. Uh, now, uh, if these are equal, you can see that, look carefully here, you'll see that the, the cross terms will actually cancel. They will go away. Right? Uh, by the way, major difference from before, this is not the Fermi drive distribution, right? Uh, at steady state, and this is another very important difference here. At equilibrium, this happens to be the Fermi Dirac distribution. At steady state, this is something different from Fermi Dirac distribution. You have pulled the system out of equilibrium now, and it's uh, 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 it, this is a genuinely non-equilibrium situation, meaning f of k is not equal to f of k zero. It's different, and uh, uh, physically, you can think that if I have a k. Uh, and then I have, you know, a distribution of f of k that would look like that because of Fermi Dirac. And then I apply an electric field. This distribution is going to shift a little bit to the right. And then this distribution is not the same as that, but there is some relation. You can see it, you know, has some uh, 
we, we'll see now. So, so the, you know, whatever is the new f of k because of this application of the drift term or the force uh, is 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 uh, you have pulled it away from from the uh, equilibrium value. So that's, but uh, regardless, so so you know, because the cross terms cancel under elastic approximation, uh, I can rewrite now that d of k or dt and then minus Q electric field over Planck's constant. Oh, K, right, uh, on the left side. And that must be equal to a sum of all scattering rates K prime. And I'll just retain one of these terms and write SK to K prime. They are both equal. And then I can, you can see when I collapse all these, what you get is f of k prime minus f of k. So, this, so all the cross terms go away. Yeah. Um, the assumption that it's elastic do, doesn't seem to directly imply that s of k to k prime and s of k prime to k are equal to each other because to derive this formula at the bottom, we also assumed that we were in equilibrium and that we, we used the equilibrium Fermi Dirac distribution. Very good question. Yeah, very good question. Right. So you're saying that I have taken away one of my approximations here, right? Yeah. Which is the equilibrium approximation. But you can see that this is very this is actually a very intriguing result because you got it from equilibrium, right? But the scattering rates by themselves are actually microscopic processes that are completely agnostic to equilibrium. They don't know whether there's equilibrium or not. So in other words, these processes are the same whether you are in equilibrium or way out of equilibrium. It doesn't matter. It's the, this, the ratio is not going to change. You know? So in other words, you derived it for equilibrium, but you suddenly realize this thing is, is true no matter whether you have equilibrium or not. Why? Because there's no Fermi level anywhere inside here. So, so that doesn't really... So this is a much more... Power, you know, overreaching result here. You know, so it's kind of an interesting point, but that's true. So we are making that assumption, and that's that's why uh, uh, it is. It, 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 we can make that uh, uh, again. Uh, by the, by now, we are making elastic and all that approximation, so we can write it as an approximate relation. But if it was completely elastic scattering, it would still be exact. You know, what I mean, because this is an exact relation. Right? Uh, okay. So now. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, see, uh, you know, if you look on the right side, you can see that uh, it looks like an equation that uh, uh, dy by dk, uh, right. <coughs> so let's look at this part here. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, write this in a slightly different way. First of all, you see this is an equation in f of k, right? f of k. And everything else you're kind of summing over. So, so if I if I look at you know kind of this sum over this, this kind of is a, is, a, is just a constant as far as this equation goes. And uh, on the right side, I'm going to uh, this is an approximation now. Again, I mean I, I know there'll be we'll go through a couple of things like this now, but uh, uh, I, I, let me write it this way. So, okay. so th this is a very important step. What we are doing is we are linearizing the right hand side. We are saying that yes, uh, you know, there's, uh, this, you know, you can say it's a linear, uh, this, in time it's changing in that sense. And we are saying that uh, on the right side, I still retain that f of k here. Everything else in front of it, you know, uh, we are summing these one over, your scattering rates, the sum over k primes is clubbed together to give you one scattering rate time. One combined time scale here, where you can see here one of tau of k will be sum of s of k to k prime of k prime. Right. Take all possible scattering, sum them, you get a certain effective rate, one over tau. So that's it. And this part f of k pr uh, prime, when you sum over it, uh, again, I'm I'm not trying to derive it, but I'm just kind of s saying that. Through a couple of steps, one can do this. Uh, and this is called a relaxation time approximation. Essentially, you're trying to linearize the differential equation because you want to solve it now. And, and the reason it's called a relaxation time approximation, or RTA, is because, well, you have found a relaxation time that characterizes the entire process on the right side, uh, a kind of uh, one, one time, time 
uh, tau that characterizes the right-hand side. So, so from here to here, uh, hopefully you can see that this kind of is obvious for the first term, for the second term, this needs just a little bit of work. I've written it up in the notes, so you can read that up, up but that's how it will look. And, and uh, uh, okay, so uh, upshot is that uh, uh, on the right side, the collision integral now has become a measure on the numerator, what we have is a measure of non-equilibrium. Here's the equilibrium distribution function. Here's the real distribution function. The difference is a measure of the non-equilibrium nature. How, if, if you have pulled it way out of equilibrium, then f of k is very, very different from f, f k naught, which is the equilibrium issue. Does that make sense? So pictorially, this is your f of k naught, which is this term. And whatever you have done now, because of non-equilibrium, is your new term, which is that one. So the bigger is the difference, the more out of equilibrium you are. And uh, physically now, uh, we can write another very important relation. So, so let's re reinstate all these terms here. So, so this is my Boltzmann transport equation under the relaxation time approximation. And now uh, you can see physically uh, why it's called the relaxation time approximation uh, will be the following. So let's say uh, I have, I'm tracking with time the distribution function f of k. And I had an electric field running from you know, way back and then <coughs> at till time here. So I, what I'm saying is I had an electric field that was flowing carriers. You know, it was causing transport of electrons. And it had pulled the distribution function to this value. And there was net current flowing right, till a certain time. And then at this time, t naught, I turn off the field abruptly. This is the electric field as a function of time. I just turn it off. Does that make sense? I add an electric field from source to drain of a transistor. And, and at time t is equal to 0, this drops. It goes to 0. right? So, so now, at, you know, it, it, now, now if I look at a certain k here, I find that because of the electric field, I had a distribution function something like that. More carriers going to the right than to the left, right? right the occupation function, which was f, k, f of k. So I plot that. It was probably, uh, I don't know, something like this. Let's say that's 1. And I'm saying this is my f of k. That's here. But I turn it off at time t is equal to 0. And when I turn it off, the electric field goes away. And the distribution function must come back to this value now. Right? Because that's the equilibrium distribution function. When you turn off the electric field, the system has to go back to equilibrium now. Right? You know, and how can it do that? This state, the occupation function of this k state must go from a high value to the fermi Dirac distribution value. Drop. Right? And, then, and, and, and that, that's. Uh, so, so, so in other words, the value, the way I've sketched it, is lower, and here's the equilibrium distribution function of f state k zero. It must go to that value over a certain time scale, right? It go from here to there, and this rate at which it's going to drop and come here is physically your relaxation time tau. You kind of see that now, hopefully, right? Because you see. Uh, you see, when, when, when I turn this 0, when I turn off the electric field, my uh, uh, Boltzmann transport equation is very simple by tau of k, right? If I turn off the electric field. And this has solution. You can write down that f of k uh, at time t is equal to f of k 0 plus uh, uh, f uh, e to the power minus t over tau. You can, you know, uh, hopefully see that this is just a linear differential equation with this kind of decay. And so essentially this distribution function will take a few tau seconds to go from here to there. And by the time you reach here, it's, 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 it's uh, equilibrium distribution function. There's no net current flowing anymore because equal right and left going carriers. Right? So that's the meaning of the Boltzmann transport equation and why it's called relaxation time approximation. And this is going as e to the power minus t over tau of k, 
where this tau of k is, uh, is a sum over all scattering rates, k prime to k, if you might. Okay. So that's, 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 that's how long it takes for the system to go back to equilibrium. Now we can uh, see two things here. And here's the answer to your question earlier. This is equilibrium, right? If I'm sitting here physically, this is what we call as equilibrium. Right? Now where is steady state? Steady state is here. Right? That is steady state. Right? That's the difference, right? So steady state is when you know appears like nothing is changing with time, but a lot of things are going on, right? A lot of things are going on at steady state, right? Uh, whereas in equilibrium, still a lot of things going on, but less. <laughs> but it's different. You can see how they're different now, right? And then, and uh, uh, so actually, this is. Uh, all right. Let's let's uh, uh, make sure that we are clear on that steady state, and that's equilibrium. And and it's it's, it's hopefully clear what's different. So there's a net current flowing at steady state and all that. Yeah. Why is it? What you're labeling steady state, why isn't f of k changing with time? Because in the equation, it still looks like you could have the f k dt not equal to zero. Uh, say that again? Why is f of k constant with respect to time? So this part, OK, good, good point. So this part is this transition between st the steady state and the equilibrium. Yes. Now at equilibrium, I have not, uh, sorry, between steady state and equilibrium. At steady state, what's our equation? At steady state, this is zero. Why do we know that it's zero? Uh, why, yeah, that's a good point. So essentially, you have turned on a field, and there's a steady state current flowing. The current is not changing with time. But the occupation function is different now from equilibrium. Does that make sense? Okay. So at steady state, this is zero, but this is not zero. That's the physical meaning of it. And there were net DC current flowing. If you cause any glitch to it, then this will come back again. So then you can try to restore it uh, back to steady state. Let me write that down, though, because the steady state is where you get the mobility and all that. So in, at steady state, this term goes to zero. And, uh, but it is not the same as equilibrium, because you have a net force that's driving it. It, it cannot be uh, d over dk. Uh, just one sec. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because literally like from this picture, if you have anything that's not a constant field, then you don't have steady state. Uh, correct. So if you have an oscillating field, then uh, which will be the case when uh, we'll have light, we'll we'll see how it uh, what what does it do. Basically, the system resonates. I mean, it 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 follows it. You know? So um, if you have an oscillating electric field, uh, then you know this this e will be e e to the power i omega t, and we'll see that you know because that's how it will talk to phonons and photons. But if I had a steady, you know, a DC electric field, this is what we're talking about at this point. At least because it clearly illustrates the meaning of these terms now, steady state and equilibrium and a non-equilibrium transition from one to another. And you know, just as an order of magnitude, uh, this rate, uh, 1 over tau, uh, rather this tau is of the order of a, you know, point, you know, point 0.3, point 0.5 picoseconds in most semiconductors. That's how long it takes for it to emit and phonons and all that. and, and, and and that sort of thing. Okay. For light, it would be about a few nanoseconds, typically. Okay, so slower. Yeah. Uh, OK, so, so if, if this is the situation, uh, the steady state situation, uh, then here uh, what you get is uh, you can write down now and you show that f of k is approximately equal to the Fermi-Dirac equilibrium distribution function. Uh, and then you'll get like a plus tau of k you know, electron charge. Uh, let me write that down. Electric field. And you know, d over dk, I'm going to just change it over a little bit. Let me write it down, and, and then uh, we will discuss that. Okay. Times v, v, group velocity of state k over. So 1 over h bar d by dk is kind of, you know, uh, leads you out to group velocity. And uh, length length over time, wait, what did I do here, tau times v,
Okay. So I think this is correct. Yeah. Okay. So this is my. You can see that it looks a little complicated, but essentially what we are, what I've written here is this is the equilibrium distribution function. Uh, this is the steady state distribution function. And because of the electric field, this is the perturbation to it. This is how far you have pulled it out of equilibrium. And it has a derivative term. By symmetry, you would know that that would be the case. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay, so and there's a scattering rate or time it takes. And this is the group velocity of electrons in the, in the band structure. And this is a solution. This is the RTA or the relaxation time approximation solution to the Boltzmann transport equation. Uh, if you put electric field is zero, the distribution function, steady state distribution function is equal to the Fermi drag distribution function, right? This is steady uh, at, at, uh, once it reaches that value. So uh, I think there's a very interesting story of uh, the steady state. Uh, goes back to 1940s. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I uh, mentioned this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is D by D E of K, energy of K, you know, h squared K squared by 2M. So I've read, read it a little bit uh, by writing, uh, all right, let me, let me write that out again. So. Uh, not time. We are looking at this term. Okay. So. <coughs> Minus of that. Okay. So so from here, we can write that uh, f of k equilibrium distribution function, and then you take everything else to the right side. Okay, so that's, that's what you get. And what I'm doing here is I'm writing it in a slightly different way. I write dE by dK and dE of f of k. The reason is I like to work, I mean, you don't have to, but you, it's e a little easier to have energy derivatives rather than k derivatives of this. So that's we're just making a small change here. That's all there is to it, really. And, and you realize that this thing here, so I think, again, you can see there's a potential for con confusion because E is electric field here, but maybe we should just write it as F, the electric field. This is band structure, and this quantity is just the group velocity. You know? 1 over h bar d by dk is just the group velocity. And uh, I think I again uh, used a minus sign here. So that, that, that gives you this quantity. So fk over dE. And there's a group velocity tau in electric field. And this is uh, 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 dimensionally, you can see this is dimensional s. And uh, electric field is in volts per meter. And electron charge time, ve velocity times time is length. And uh, the, that goes, the meter goes away. Charge times voltage is energy, and energy and this goes away. So you, uh, you go back to dimensional. So you kind of check that here. OK, so uh, now um, uh, what I wanted to do then is, is uh, so I kind of tried to uh, get, get uh, the uh, meaning of, of, of steady state and the, and the uh, equilibrium. At steady state, to summarize, we have an electric field, and there's scattering going on, there's you know, uh, more carriers going to the right, less to the left. For example, if your, your net uh, particle flow is to the right, and there's current flow, and uh, uh, the distribution function is not a Fermi Dirac distribution, because the Fermi Dirac distribution will always give you a net zero current, right? Uh, so, so and, and, and all the uh, net current comes from this term. Okay. So, okay. Uh, uh, so this is what you call as the asymmetric term. Uh, of the distribution function, and that's this derivative really tells you that, you know, this is the asymmetric term. And so if, if there's no derivative with energy, then it will be symmetric around the, you know, zero. Right? So, so that this derivative gives you that uh, asymmetric term. Uh, 
Now, uh, what we have not talked about is this tau now, the tau or the scattering rate. And I want to spend maybe a few minutes uh, talking about that because uh, that's one of the problems here that you are uh, 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 solving. <coughs> By the way, just to uh, you know, be clear, uh, this, this uh, topic uh, is, is definitely um, uh, need, needs a little bit of uh, uh, time to absorb, but uh, I've written it up, so if you want to discuss a bit more, please come by and we'll discuss during office hours or other times. But, uh, uh, right, so, so once we uh, are able to write the Boltzmann transport equation solution in that way, hopefully you saw where it came from, uh, we can now use that distribution function to calculate electron density or current or whatever, we, because you know how to do that. Once you know your f of k, you can find the current now, and then that's the term that goes in. What I was trying to stress is this first term, which is the even term or the symmetric term, will give you a zero. Right? All the current comes from this term. Right? And you can see that that's proportional to electric field, therefore the current becomes proportional to field, and you get your Ohm's law and all that sort of thing. And then this is a, a little bit of a decomposition here, where you can write it in terms current as a function of electron density n, and this whole quantity here is going to be your, your uh, mobility now. Right? So, 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 so that's, that's the tau sits inside here. And I want to kind of uh, give you one example of the calculation of tau uh, and, and uh, uh, um, the example is, is if I have an ionized donor, then the uh, Right, let's look at that problem. Okay. So uh, this rate, uh, S of k to k prime, uh, is, is what's going to give me my, my uh, uh, net, uh, the net, net rate at which uh, uh, I can you know, transition. So in other words, it will give me my tau of k. So that's a microscopic process, and one needs to pay attention to how, how to actually calculate it. I'll, I will, what I'll do is I'll outline it right now, and I know that you have an assignment pr problem with a couple of sections where you are supposed to use it, right in, the, uh, in this problem here. Uh, so B and C is where you are supposed to use it. Okay. So I think in the in the uh, you know interest of we making sure that you guys actually do it, uh, let's uh, you know I'm going to outline it now. But I, I see that I need a little more time to to work it out in detail. Uh, so I will continue this on Thursday uh, because essentially this is the process of light matter interaction too. So photonics. So we're kind of going in that direction. So this is uh, uh, the rate, the microscopic details of that process. And how you calculate it is what's uh, done by the Fermi Golden Rule. Now, just like for perturbation theory, I'm not, I did uh, time independent perturbation theory, I did not try to derive that in class because that requires quite a bit of uh, work. I have a chapter that I wrote up, a short chapter on how you get uh, the uh, scattering rate in this form. Uh, I want to kind of uh, uh, urge you to read that at least once. Uh, and there's also a couple of old lectures uh, which we have videos for. I can point you if you want to see the derivation as well. But uh, let me just uh, make sure physically explain what we are looking at here. If I have a state k and a state k prime, and its energies are E of k and E of k prime, right? then the question is, what is this rate s of k to k prime? That, that's what we are uh, trying to ask now, microscopically. This is not saying anything about whether this state is occupied. That state is empty. It doesn't care. It's what is the rate? Yeah. And whether it's occupied or not occupied, I'll take, it, take care of it later using my f of k's and f k primes. Does that make sense? So it's microscopically just telling you whether the scattering is possible at all or not. Whether, you know, uh, does that make sense? I mean, uh, act, uh, not caring whether there are electrons or not, right? Meaning, if there are electrons, is the scattering rate possible? That's really what we are after, right? And, and that rate will be uh, what we'll derive in the next class then, or, or rather use in the next class is to show that it's given by this formulation. If I know the wave functions of these two states, psi of k and psi of k prime, and I know what is the potential 
that is causing the scattering. Let's say I have an ionized impurity and there's electron going in with a momentum k. That has a wave function psi of k, right? And C is a charged impurity and it scatters to k prime. Its momentum changes, it gets redirected, right? right? And, and it comes out here and its wave function becomes C, psi of k prime, right? In band structure, maybe, you know, here's k and here's k prime. So it goes maybe from here to here, you know, or, or it goes from here to here or something like that, right? It changes its k. So as a result, its energy may change, its wave function may change, and all these things may change, right? And this, uh, the formula, Fermi's golden rule, will tell you what is that rate. It will give you a, a way to calculate it. And the way it's, it's done is uh, you, you, you write psi of, uh, I think you have kind of seen earlier that you know, the probability, or rather the uh, amplitude of this process actually happening in quantum mechanics is always given by this matrix element, psi of k. Uh, in, in, in Dirac notation, you start from state k, you see a potential W of R, and you end up in state K prime. This is the direct notation picture. And, and uh, in, 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 in full-blown formula, you integrate over all space, the initial wave function, the scattering potential, and the final wave function. Right? That's the physical meaning. So once we do that, uh, we get our matrix element, and take this matrix element, and uh, there's a bit more you know, uh, work to account for all possible states. You square it, and there's an, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, explain when we derive this in the next class uh, what I mean by that. Okay. So there's a statement of what you call as energy conservation in, in this entire process. If the scattering occurs by absorption of a phonon or you know, emission of a phonon, then the initial state minus final state is equal to that difference. And this is the Dirac delta function. It's a continuous function. And uh, that ensures that the energy conservation is, uh, is not violated. This is the matrix element or selection rule, if you might, whether the scattering is allowed or not in the first place. You know. and, and that's your Fermi golden rule. And by applying it, uh, we are now going to be able to calculate, uh, uh, as a first example, uh, you know, if you have an ionized impurity how do you calculate your scattering rate due to ionized impurities? That's the, the question we are going to look at. You know? So in, in that case, what I'm going to uh, suggest, I wanted to do it properly in the next class because this is really a uh, precursor to the photon, uh, electron-photon interaction. Uh, so uh, what we can do is uh, you can, I'm going to suggest the following. Turn in your assignment tomorrow uh, without uh, the last two parts of number question number five, which require this stuff. And uh, we will move this over to the next assignment. So B and C of question 25, uh, we'll do it in the next, you know, turn it in the next assignment. It just takes a little longer, but I think it's important to do things properly. So. Okay, so, uh, but turn in the first part, because that should be doable now, based on what we discussed, in, in, and I think you will find it hopefully useful. So, yeah. Okay, and we'll have office hours today at, uh, five, from 5 to 6.30. One quick assignment for the next lab. Uh, please sign up and maintain the same team uh, because you will submit just one report in the end. So, yeah, and Reith has the sign-up sheet. Yeah. <coughs>